and welcome to ECHO, the EBPF and Cilium Office Hours live stream. I'm Liz Rice and this is episode number 93. As always, if you're watching us live, do say hello, let us know where you're watching from and um, as we go through the show, we always love to have questions from the audience. So uh, yeah, please do let us know where you are. Already got Quentin uh, saying hello. Nice to see you, Quentin. And uh, I'm sure there will be more people joining us very soon. We always have like a little delay between me speaking and you seeing things live on, on YouTube. So uh, <laughs> it's always that sort of, it, can somebody hear me? I'm sure you can. All right, let's bring in the headlines. So a few things that I wanted to mention today. Um, one is that the slides are now available online from the... BPF part of the Linux Kernel Developers LSF MM BPF Summit. It's a bit of an acronym mouthful. But basically, this is uh, an invitation only uh, conference, get together summit where Linux kernel developers working on some of these specific subsystems get together and talk about ideas and uh, share their proof of concepts and, and so on and so forth. So a couple of uh, those that I wanted to mention, one is uh, the anthem. So uh, if you saw CiliumCon, you might have seen uh, the Cilium rap. Following on from that, we now have an anthem of BPF. I will say this is actually uh, generated by AI. So this was from Alexei Starovoitov's uh, talk at that BPF comp. Definitely worth checking out the, the slides of that and his kind of vision for, for BPF. The other um, slides that I've linked in the show notes, which you can find in HackMD, down there is the link. Um, yeah, the other set of slides that I've linked to are Lawrence's slides about BPF signing. So what we're going to be talking about later in the show is BPF signing. And you can find the presentation that he gave at BPF Conf in that set of slides. A few other things that uh, caught my attention this week. One is uh, Lewis's write-up of how to unit test eBPF programs. So this uses the BPF prog run um, flavor of the BPF system call to, uh, to run BPF programs. So if you're writing programs and you want to check that they work, then uh, this might be a really helpful guide. I see Russell has joined us. Oh, it's nice to see you, Russell. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next item that I brought up, oh, cookie pop-ups. Don't you just love them? Um, this is uh, Matt AC writing in Tech Republic, and he's written up about Cilium Mesh. So this is a fairly recently announced, um, say, extension to Cilium, where we no longer only connect uh, Kubernetes clusters with Cilium. We can also connect to external workloads. So if you're working in multi-cloud, you may have multiple Kubernetes cluster and, and Cilium has had cluster mesh to address that for, for some years now. But then we also have Cilium mesh, which extends that concept so that you can connect with external workloads running on VMs, running in you know, your on-prem environments. So really Cilium mesh is about connecting everything to everything. And the last headline that I wanted to mention is that the Linux Foundation's Introduction to Cilium course is now live. I think we've mentioned this on the show before, um, but if you go to uh, either LFX or you can actually find it directly here on edX, this is a, a free introduction to Cilium. There, there is also an option to pay for a certification, mm -hmm. but uh, if you're really just interested in the content, then this is a free resource that you might find really useful. So those are the headlines. Now, I already mentioned uh, the topic for today, which is, uh, oh, lost control of my mouse, there we go. Uh, yeah, the, so the topic for today is gonna be BPF signing. So let me welcome to Echo, Lawrence Bauer, 
who uh, I met, as I mentioned, presented on this at BPFCon, and he's going to be sharing the, the, the concept, the idea, and uh, the kind of presentation with us today, and we can understand what it is that makes BPF signing so challenging. So welcome, Lawrence. Hi, Liz. Thanks so much for having me. So um, maybe just uh, mention a little bit about what you what you do. I mean, you, you work, you're my colleague at Isovalent, right? What, what That's right. <laughs> um, so I, I joined fairly recently, actually. So I've been at Isovalent since February. Um, and I work on the Cilium agent, which is the main thing implementing the CI. Um, mm -hmm. And then I have a, a bit of a longer history with the Cilium project, I would say. Um, I've been maintaining the Cilium eBPF library for a couple of years together with uh, and our colleague. Uh, and it's great to be here. Yes, you work on that with, with Timo, who has That's been right. on a previous episode of, of Echo talking about that uh, Cilium eBPF library. So maybe that's another topic we can come back to uh, sure. on another, another time. But for yeah. now, let's turn to BPF signing. I'll, I'll bring in your, your slides that uh, this is similar to what you presented at the, the BPF conf, right? Yeah, exactly. So I, I really like the name BPF Conf that rolls off the tongue much more than LSF MM BPF. So I'll keep using that. Um, you're right. This is a talk I gave, um, I think, about two weeks ago. And I've kind of lightly edited the slides. So if you look at them, at the link that's in the show notes, they're going to be a bit different, kind of more targeted towards like Perl developers. But I wanted to kind of take a step back and, I guess, explain the, the problem a bit more in detail, I would say. Um, kind of to the, the problem statement, I guess, is uh, the headline is that eBPF is very powerful. I think most people that are kind of watching the stream are going to know about eBPF. They're going to have experience with it. They're going to know kind of the things you can build with it. Certainly um, with this great power, though, comes also um, the potential for abuse. Like I said, uh, I think there's people that have built key loggers, uh, rootkits, all of these kinds of things. Um, and I think as a kind of the way I put it at the conference is that as a community working on eBPF, there's not something that we should be happy about. Like, obviously we aren't, but we also should be thinking about how we can prevent these kinds of abuse. Yeah. And it's certainly and, something that comes up when I, um, you know, if I'm giving a presentation about eBPF quite often, a question that will get asked is, is this, you know, you've just shown me how powerful it is. Isn't this dangerous? So yeah. absolutely, it, it's a completely valid concern that, that users and potential users have. Absolutely, yeah. It's a very sharp tool. And I think that there's been a lot of discussion on this topic, like how can we, like you said, it, it, it keeps coming up this question, like how secure is it, how safe is it, should I be using it, et cetera. And for that reason, there's been a lot of discussion about what could we do, like how could we make it safer, I guess. And this is a really difficult topic because by necessity, we're going to have to make, in a way, you could look at it by saying we need to make the tool less sharp. We need to make PPF less versatile. And that's why there's been kind of a lot of back and forth and like, how could we actually fix this problem? Um, and what I want to kind of do is, I guess, uh, like I said, at these conferences, like it's almost like every year there's going to be another presentation on this topic. Like we've been talking about this for uh, maybe three years, four years. And there's like a new idea every year, and, like it doesn't work out. It doesn't, you know. So I guess this year was my my turn to go and uh, present about it and see what happens. Um, so the kind of the very high level idea that I wanted to riff off of is um, like the, the most recent proposal, I guess, was that. Um, to make BPF more secure, what we should do is sign the BPF bytecode. What does that mean? Like we take the instructions that make up a BPF program, right? We hash that, turn it, and then we add a signature to the hash. Uh, and I wrote here, this is not crypto advice. Like there's like loads of detail that goes into this that kind of makes it difficult. Um, but like on the very high level, that's like the idea that was floated. Like we should be doing this like when when you take a program, you give it to the kernel. The kernel is going to say, well, do I recognize the signature? Is this from somebody I trust? Uh, and if not, it would reject this program. I think this idea of signing is something that people are hearing about a lot in the kind of broader cloud native community as well. So things like, um, uh, and we'll talk about some of the projects that um, that address this later, but certainly 
organizations like the Open SSF, where they're really looking at how can we verify that the software you're running is is the thing that you intended to run and came from a trusted source. So this idea of signing code is pretty prevalent these days. So absolutely, yeah. what makes it different with BPF? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. The, 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 the nitty gritty is that actually this kind of the, the usual workflow that you have when you, I guess, develop eBPF is that you write a C program and then use something like Clang to turn that into the actual eBPF bytecode. And then you learn, you load that into the kernel and it, that sounds really quick, but actually there's a lot of magic that goes on between the kind of Clang gives you the binary and loading it to the kernel. So there's loads of stuff that happens in the user space that kind of the libraries use libbpf or psyllium eBPF. They will do a lot of behind the scenes work to make sure that the code that you're loading is actually fit for the kernel that you're trying to load it into. And one like really good example is something called core compile once from everywhere. And the idea is you can like take a BPF program, uh, write it once, and then the library will actually take it and patch it up uh, and adjust it for the way that the kernel has changed between different versions, like the data structure is going to be different stuff like that. And all of this core stuff tends to happen in user space. Now, the, the result of core is that the, the, the set of instructions that you load into the kernel has been changed. And so if you try to sign what Clang gave you, then obviously that doesn't work because it all blows up. Yeah, the kernel couldn't tell the difference between something that's been modified deliberately and sort of legitimately by libbpf or something that's been tampered with maliciously. There, there's no way of, of telling which of those two cases has occurred. So uh, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And so part of this proposal, when I said like there's a lot of uh, detailing here, part of the proposal would, would be that we actually need to move a lot of the stuff that happens in user space right now. We'd have to move that into the kernel, right? We'd have to say core actually happens in the kernel. Um, okay. <laughs> all of these things that live in libbpf now would kind of go into the kernel. And that kind of has implications for how easy is it for you to, to fix it when core goes wrong, right? Because the the, the, the mechanism is a heuristic, right? That's going to kind of looks at names. It looks at what does the type look like, et cetera. But this heuristic could go wrong. So if you need to fix your heuristic, it's nice that right now you can just update libbpf or whatever. And you're going right. to get to Rather than it. upgrading the kernel or patching the kernel or using an eBPF program to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So that's kind of, that, that's kind of the proposal that was on the table. And, um, I think then my, my next slide is uh, uh, was that like this is the reaction that the, the average Cilium developer is going to have to this proposal, like is like screaming, pulling our hair out. And um, the reason for this is that like the, the way that we use eBPF is really quite complex. Like Cilium, actually, when you kind of get the, the Cilium container image, it actually ships a copy of Clang because we need to compile C code on the fly. We actually, when the pod starts up, like we compile a program, then um, we cache the result of this compilation because it's expensive, of course. But then later on, we go in and, and actually look at the bytecode and then tweak these little values here and there, depending on what features have been enabled. Um, and all of that is essentially incompatible with signed BPF bytecode, mm -hmm. right? If, if, I, if the, I think I've seen other simpler examples where people, you know, there's a compiled program that maybe has, you know, uh, some kind of constant value that just gets replaced as, you know, before the program gets loaded into the kernel. I think that's, yeah. you know, Cilium is not the only case where where that kind of For sure. modifying the program. Yeah, I should have, maybe maybe it's useful, like BPF trace, for example, it's like a really powerful tool that, that is built entirely on eBPF. And it's really difficult to see how BPF trace would work in a, in a world where only signed BPF programs were allowed, right? Because the power in BPF trace is that you can iterate, you can write a script. The script is going to look at what the kernel gives you and then you change it again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. It's not just the Cilium developers reaction. I think there's other people that react like this, but it's <laughs> kind of a tongue in cheek uh, moment that allows me to kind of um, uh, riff of that. And like maybe to visualize it a little bit, this is the output from a program that a colleague of mine, Anton wrote. 
um, and I think the like the, the text is probably a bit hard to read, but it's not that important. What this shows is actually uh, a Cilium container or Cilium programs and how they relate to each other. So each box will be a program uh, and each arrow is a program kind of calling into another program with a tail call. And the, the thing I want to show is like how complicated actually the setup is. There's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of moving parts, and a lot of these things actually happen at runtime. Mm. And this would be a lot of things to sign. You know, if you wanted to try and sign every individual program, never mind whether or not it would work or not, there'd also be like an operational complexity in just having to sign a lot of different things that for sure could be quite hard to manage. Yeah. That could be really hard to manage. So the, the question becomes, okay, if signing the program isn't workable for us, what, what else could we do? Um, and so the, the idea that had been floated before and that I kind of wanted to present on at this conference was that instead of like on the left-hand side, you can see instead of this idea of signing the individual programs, what if we could say we sign the Cilium agent, right? We say this binary that produces eBPF and that loads eBPF into the kernel that comes from a trusted source, comes from the Cilium project. Um, we want to allow this, right? And I think the, the point here is that although it's the user space agent that's signed, we want to validate that from the kernel. So the Absolutely. kernel is able to say, I trust the thing that's loading these eBPF programs. Yeah, so what it really boils down to is like in the kernel, there's a syscall, a function that you can invoke. Um, and we want to be able to say this syscall should only be invoked by programs that have a signature attached to them. Makes sense. Um, so I, I, I went out and built a proof of concept and made a little shopping list and like I listed these three things that say, oh, this is, this is what we need. I, I'm going to quickly go through them like we need some sort of an identity for binary. That's usually a hash, like we do SHA-256 sum or something. Um, we need to kind of say, we trust this hash. That's usually a signature. And then we need a way to express a policy. And I think it was really interesting when we kind of, in the run up to the show, when we went through this, you, you said like, oh, it's really interesting. Cause like the, the way that I use policy here, like has a slightly different meaning than you know, what the cloud native idea of policy is, but they're kind of trying to achieve very similar goals in a way. Yeah, I, I mean, there's certainly parallels here to the the, the cloud native tools. So things like um, Notary or Cosign, where I mean, a lot of people will have seen um, containers have a hash. They are identified by hash. And, and in fact, oh. you, can, you can pull container images by their hash, uh -huh. the content addressable. So... If you don't have the correct hash, you can't pull the the image. Or if, if you've got the wrong hash, you, you won't get you, know, you won't get an image uh, unless there's a hash that matches. Um, so I guess this idea of you know having a, a hash that identifies a program is is pretty uh -huh. well understood in in that kind of container world. And the idea of signing those binaries, signing those artifacts, is certainly something that's getting a lot of attention in in these projects. Yeah. And then this idea of the, the policy, there's a lot of different options for how you might write a policy in, in user spaces, tools like Open Policy Agent, or um, uh, I think the SIGStore has, has its own, I'm, I'm forgetting now what, what the kind of verification tool is called, but this idea that, yeah, you have to, the policy would be, here's a set of signing entities that I trust. I will, I will uh -huh. accept it if, if I understand the signature. Yeah. And I think what, what I also thought was interesting that like the way that I approached it is like very much from the I kind of, I started the kernel and then I kind of worked my way towards user space in a way. And I think when we were talking in the way you explained what Sigstore and these other things do, it's like, it's almost at the other end of the, the spectrum. It's like, it starts in user space and kind of, works with OCI registries and all this other stuff. And there's like this gap in the middle where I think it's not quite clear how we could bridge these two. And that's like where the really interesting stuff probably mm. didn't happen, I think. Mm. Yes, yes. I, I, I do think it's really interesting that this whole concept of supply chain security, you know, we need to look at it at every layer, you know, from, right. the, kernel, from the kernel up. And uh, yeah, maybe there's some common... Common work that can be shared, yeah. That'd be nice.
So let me let me kind of go into the shopping list and kind of what I chose for my proof of concept. And the first thing I I wanted to or I needed to figure out is like I need to somehow identify uh, an executable that you have on your file system. And it turns out that Linux has this concept called FS Verity. Um, uh, and as far as I know, this was like added by Android because Android kind of has a similar need. They want to be able to say, this is a binary that comes from an APK, I guess. And this, this binary has not been tampered with and we should allow it to run, I guess. Um, it turns out that it's really easy to enable it. If you have it, like most distros have it enabled by default, as far as I can tell, like Fedora, for example. You can just, you just have to run this command and boom, you've enabled FS Verity. Now, what does FS Verity give you? It gives you two things. One, it kind of has this idea of a hash. We've talked about that. And the other thing is also that it, it makes it so that the file becomes immutable. So you can't just open it behind, you know, behind the kernel's back and like write stuff into it. Um, and that is really important because otherwise like verifying this hash doesn't really have a meaning in a way, right? Because you want to be able to say this hash identifies the file, but if you can then afterwards say, oh, I've modified the file now then. Right, kind of right. So you don't way. want to recalculate the hash before you do the, the test on it. So you want to be able to say, here is a, a, a hash I created earlier, but I know that yeah. it cannot have, the file cannot have changed since I exactly. had that hash. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we get from FS Verity. And um, there's other ways we could do this. There's like this whole like big table that I had in the slides. Um, and there's a link at the bottom uh, from, uh, I stole this from a blog post that Meta did. Um, I think it's really interesting because it shows you like at the top, you have open SSL, DGST, I guess, digest, which shows you like there's like user space things. And you could think that cosign actually, or six door or what these things are, they actually sit at the top in this diagram as well. So they could be an input to this mechanism. Mm. Um, and then as you go down, you have like different trade-offs where you can say, you know, how fast does this, does this apply to a single file? Does it apply to like a whole file system, I guess? Um, but for the proof of concept that I did, like the easiest really was FS Verity. Um, and if you want, we can like dive into this a little bit later, or we can just kind of go to the next Next part, I'm not sure what you would prefer. Yeah, no, let, let's let's move on. <laughs> okay, number two is like, uh, we need to kind of say, what do I trust? And usually that's a signature. And I I didn't want to invent my own signature format because that tends to be like uh, difficult and also probably a bit tedious. Um, like there's a lot of details you need to get right. Uh, so it was better to kind of find something that exists. And there's this thing in Linux that's called IMA. I'm probably gonna get the abbreviation wrong. I think it's Integrity and Measurement Architecture. Yeah, Integrity like Measurement that. Architecture, I think it is, yeah. Yeah, um, and I think the idea behind it is that you can you, you start your system and then at any point in time, you can actually figure out what's running in a way. Like you can get a hash and that hash identifies all the programs on your system, right? You could say, oh, this is the kernel I've been running. This is the system D that I've been running, this is the system that I've been running, and all feeds into this one big thing, which is interesting, but it's kind of a bit of a detour, so I'll skip, stop there. <laughs> um, but like IMA has the signature format, it has a lot of the tooling that I need for it, uh, kind of to build my proof of concept, right? You can do these things in user space, sign files, kind of attach a signature to a file, etc. I think that's actually an interesting concept to just touch on for a second you know because you've got this file you know a, a series of bytes on disk and then the signature is sort of not inherently part of that file I mean th this is something that you know we we it was a bit of a challenge for container images as well that you know uh -huh. the the signature or whatever you're going to use the metadata kind of has to go along with that binary content but they're not you know, they're inherently two separate things, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how do so you do it the, in the is, container does IMA, I, I'll, I'll, uh, Does IMA give a, um, a kind of structure for managing that file plus its metadata? Is, is that what IMA exactly, is yeah. giving? Yeah. Yeah. 
exactly and uh, and like also like a format for the metadata right mm -hmm. that, that is understood and like the most important thing is like there's actually code in the kernel that knows how to retrieve these things and also kind of there's a lot of i guess stuff magic you have to do in the kernel or to be able to verify a signature right? it's quite complicated actually so that's that's what it gives us there's some integrations that are listed here um Key Lime is something I thought was interesting with the cloud native computing plantation thing. It's also the idea of being able to say, I can figure out what my system is running and that therefore I can say that it's secure and un, uh, unattacked, I guess. I'm not sure what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. I think some of these, uh, my, my recollection is that Key Lime allows you to sort of validate using a kind of hardware security module that's external to the machine or I think. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I only like I was googling around. I was like, "Oh, this sounds interesting. I have an integration." So, um, I guess what I want to say is like, there's interesting avenues. Like, this could be integrated with other parts of the ecosystem, mm. uh, which was important to me. And then the third way. Now, well, there's some alternatives here, which is maybe a bit too in depth, but we can jump back if we want to. We could do other things, right? We don't have to do IMA. We could come up with our own system. It's a bit like here, this is what we've been talking about. I said cloud native signatures, uh, cosine, notary, six store. Um, and I think that this is one bullet point, which maybe we can drill down into a little bit later. Is yeah, so, let's, let's come back to that. Let's yeah. come back to that. Um, and then finally, the, the, a way to express a policy. And for my use case, like because it's the BPF conf, the policy is written in BPF is a Linux security module, and that's the thing that allows us to say, actually, when you invoke the BPF syscall, we're not going to allow you to do this. Right. And the the stuff I need in the kernel is not there out of the box, so I added some new helpers. Uh, right, and and those kernel. are the kfunks, which... This um, is what the kfunks refer to, yeah. Yeah, and kfunks is probably worth just touching on briefly because it's relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding of it is basically you can declare pretty much any function so that BPF can call into it. Yeah, exactly. It's incredibly easy. Like it used to be if you wanted to make a function available to BPF, you would have to like use this special syntax basically in the kernel. You would have to fill out all this metadata, make sure that it's all like just right so that the verifier understands it. Now it's, yeah, it's like five lines of code essentially. And that makes a huge difference. Like I was super surprised when I, like this was the first time I was adding any K funks. Um, and I was really surprised at how productive it is. Really amazing. Right. Yeah. So I've been talking a long time. Uh, this is where maybe the, the, the interesting part starts, depending. Um, I, I made this uh, little demo that I would like to show you. Um, and it starts with me just kind of booting a small lightweight virtual machine uh, that has a patched kernel. Um, the stuff that I've been talking about. Um, I can show you what's part of the, like this BPF variety, I call it. It's open source, you can look at it. Um, but let me maybe start the setup first. Um, this is all to do with how I built the proof of concept. Um, it's not super interesting. We can go over it later if need be. But let me show you, these are the files that are really necessary to pull it off, there's the cert and key dir. These are just public key and private key. There's create map. That's just a binary that I use to show that the proof of concept works. And the only thing it does is creates a BPF map and then prints whether that was successful or not. And then there's the gatekeeper. That's like the really interesting thing. Now, the first thing I need, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm just, uh, so I guess in this example, you're gonna be signing locally. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. And in a kind of, uh, you know, more real world example, presumably the, the signing part would happen, you know, on one machine and the verifying part would happen, you know, on another. Somewhere Wait. else. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you would, uh, I guess how it would work is like whenever, let's take Cilium as an example, whenever Cilium releases cut, we will cut a release and afterwards we would say, this is, you know, the, the container that we've built and we add a signature. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So um, 
first thing I need to do is I need to sign a gatekeeper. Like this is a great foot gun. Uh, I started out <laughs> with like not signing the gatekeeper. And then, yeah, basically the gatekeeper itself is not allowed to access BPF anymore. That doesn't work very well. <laughs> So I'm going to start this gatekeeper and put it in the background. And you can already see that there's like this debug message here where it says granting access. And this is the bit like if I hadn't signed the gatekeeper, this is where it would go wrong. Uh, and now the, what I can show you is like this create map binary. I'm going to run that and you can see like denying access, denying access, denying access. And then indeed we get an error from the program that says I'm not actually permitted to access BPF. And that's exactly what we want, right? Um, and the way to fix it is just doing this, oops. I'm gonna do the same sign operation I did earlier. Does some magic. And then I can just rerun create map. And you can see that here it says, oh, I can actually find the signature I'm granting you access. Great, and we're seeing that logged out a few times, presumably because it's making the BPF system call a few times. <laughs> to Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So there's a bunch of magic in, the, in this library that it's using that does some tests in the back and tries to find, figure out, is this correct? Can I use these test calls? And that's why we have multiple there. Great. And this is made, pretty made much the demo. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it worked. Fantastic. So I guess in, in that kind of real world example, the gatekeeper would be running on your local machine. The create map would have come from you know some supplier and that supplier would have signed create map before they delivered it to you huh. and then uh what you run on the machine would just be you'd run create map and the gatekeeper would verify the signature yeah yeah all right well that made a lot of sense to me um Let's bring back, should we bring back the slides and then uh, we can maybe go back to the, um, I don't know if you want to go forward or go back to the, the, the comments about things like cosine. What do you think? Um, I think we can go back to the comments about cosine if I can. Yeah. Yeah. This is maybe the one or which one did you mean? Yeah, no, th this one. Yeah. Yeah. I guess one, one thing is let's, Talk a bit about that first bullet, the FS Verity signatures. So is that a kind of additional component? You, you're using FS Verity for the kind of file hash. Uh -huh. And then from what I'm seeing there, there is the ability to sign them, but it's not currently a kind of complete implementation. Yeah. So I think um, the way I understand it is that it's, it's there, but it's not enabled by default in most distros. Mm -hmm. And the um, tricky part with signatures is always like, how do you handle the, like what, um, I'm not sure how to best explain this. Like, how do you handle trust, I guess? Like, where does, how do you manage, who do you trust? Like, it's usually it's, it'd be like, oh, I trust Cilium or I trust, I don't know, Fedora or something like that. How do you manage that? And I think that's probably what's missing from the FS Verity piece. It doesn't have all of these bits in place. Like you can do the basic thing, which is I can create a signature and I could put it in the kernel, but you might need additional machinery to say, actually this, this signature was fraudulent. Somebody managed to compromise some project and we know that happened. Right. So we want to be able to say, no, no, I actually don't trust this thing. Also, although it has like the right maths going on. Yeah. So maybe, you know, the, the signatures need to use things like X509 certificates and, and that kind of fairly well understood chaining of signed by X, signed by Y, signed by yeah. a root certificate that we all know and trust. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that's what's missing from SS, FS Verity, right? So it's like okay. it works, but you kind of you would have to do more work to actually make it like really foolproof. Um, and then I, I put down uh, the cloud native signatures. We've talked about them a bunch. And I think these are like exactly like you described, like, or you, you probably actually understand better how they work, but um, I think it's like, you take this hash that the container is a ha has a hash, you can retrieve it by that hash. And then I guess 
cosine and notary will just go and sign that hash and then put that information somewhere. Yeah, if, uh, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and there's a, a format for including that in the OCI registry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then the second bullet point is like this is not clear how to bridge to file file system image. This is like the uh, this is where I'm hiding that I don't actually know how it works. Essentially, right? So <laughs> the way in, in my head, like an OCI bundle is a tarball or GZIP tarball or something like that. And it makes sense that you can sign the tarball, but then the kernel never sees a tarball, right? It doesn't execute a tarball. The kernel executes a file that's on a file system somewhere. And somehow the container tar gzip is transformed into a file system somewhere. Yeah. The bit that I don't understand, the bit that's interesting is like, how would you go from a model where you have cosine or, or notary or whatever? Like, I don't have any preference it's just the one that goes over the tongue the easiest but we have cosine sign a bundle and then somehow we need to make the kernel aware of this and that's yes. the bit that i don't understand right this is where the the gap is for me yeah i agree um, I, I think that piece is currently missing but could be really interesting how you go from the kernel knowing here is a file how could we then associate that back to the yeah the the image the the oci bundle and its metadata to get the right certificate information to, to validate. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, what I think is exciting, if, if this did work, right, then we could actually say, um, we've downloaded this image from a trusted third party and we verified that there's actually the same code all the way up into the kernel. Mm. And then kind of going, this is why I mentioned key lime earlier, like it also goes out of the kernel again, right? Because you could say, you could then take that information, you could plug it into a system that tells you all of the software on your system is actually trusted in some mm. fashion, right? And obviously like this is not gonna be, like this is not what most companies or people will do by default because it's a lot of work. But I think in my mind, it's nice to know that there is a way to actually go in that direction that we could build a system like this. But probably much more pragmatic it would be to maybe plug into cosine and notary um, and kind of say, well, if you've verified a, a, a bundle or something like that, then I'm going to do some work behind the scenes to figure out what's the, the files that come out of this OCI bundle and then say, to the kernel, well, actually, these are files you can trust. Like we know about them. This is this is good. And then, you know, you can have an approximation of this that's a little bit less secure, but it probably would be a lot more practical in the in the end. Mm, yeah, I think it's definitely like, some really interesting discussions to be had between you know the BPF community and the uh, you know the the kind of secure supply chain community in in cloud native land. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's really it. Like the third point is custom BPF signatures. Um, it's not something I think we should do because it's a lot of work and little benefit. Um, but I kind of put it on the slide as a, just to be complete. Yeah. Uh, and really, that's 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 it. Um, like I have these conclusions takeaway slide at the end, but I think the most important takeaway is like it works. Yeah. <laughs> it was it wasn't too much to to do it. Um, and the interesting kind of next steps would be, or are, like, how do we plug this into actual tooling that is, gets used? Yes, yes. And I think this, um, making things easy to use, you know, one of, one of the biggest challenges with anything to do with security is getting people to actually do the, the best practices and people will only do it if it's easy and straightforward or, or they're much more likely to do it if it's easy and straightforward so the more we could plug things in such that you know the infrastructure took care of making sure that the image you pulled was from a trusted registry and then the, the image was not tampered with and came from a trusted supplier and then when you unpack the image like you said maybe that can tell the kernel about what uh what programs are trusted to to run bpf it, if all that can be plumbed together and made to run automatically, that will be a really big step forward, I think. That would be amazing, yeah. 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 All right. 
Okay, I've got a couple more uh, comments coming in. So uh, first of all, just saying hi to Sadiq, who's watching us from Oman. So welcome to you, Sadiq. And uh, Will, who is another regular viewer, uh, throwing something out there, working with UBPF, which is the user space implementation of uh, BPF verification, if I'm mistaken. Uh -huh. I think that's correct. I think it's used by the Windows on UBPF. Yes, yes, uh, that's true. Uh, and we would love to support signing. So, uh, yeah, oh. support already for this idea. <laughs> Fantastic. I hope it's the right kind of signing, though. But we should yeah. talk a bit. <laughs> Actually, that, that's a, a question. What was the response to this uh, proof of concept when you presented it at BPF Comp? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I think it was, um, I think sometimes... When, when you go into the conference, it can be a bit daunting. And I was a bit worried that it would fall flat. But I think the, I think it was really positive in the sense that um, the good thing about this is that it gives a lot of flexibility that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, like with the signing, signing the BPF code, like it gives an answer to how do you deal with Cilio and BPF tracing. All of these tools are really useful and that people probably want to run. Um, mm. Um, so I think it was really good. And then obviously the question was like, what are you going to do? When is this going to land upstream? Are you going to, you know, keep pushing this? And I think, I guess this is part of it is like trying to have a conversation of what should this actually look like? Um, um, some specific things, I think, uh, somebody from Meta approached me and they were quite pleased like with the idea of hooking into IMA, which I did. And they said, oh, this is actually really nice. Maybe we should be doing this more. Um, so yeah, I was really, I was really happy with the reception. Great. So, um, what do you think the next steps are going to be to, you know, I mean, like everything in the kernel, it will be a while before we see this landing on a distribution near you. Right. But, uh, yeah, that's true. I think there's two, there's two possible paths. One is more work more with the cloud native ecosystem. Try and figure out what the cosine, the six stores, et cetera, what they do and how that could be used to make things more secure. That's probably the mm -hmm. pragmatic approach, I would say. Probably also much more difficult, I imagine, because there's more different, you know, more people you need to talk to, more stakeholders, more different ideas. The other thing would be that I take the proof of concept that I've written, like which patches to the kernel essentially, then polish them, put them upstream, and then kind of hope that. In the future, this thing is going to become reality. Um, I'm still a bit torn which one is the, the right approach. Um, yeah, but I think the, the, the tooling side is probably the one that's more useful ultimately. Yeah. Like, sorry, yeah. going to the cloud native ecosystem, I should have said that. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay, audience, if you have any questions, now is the time to. Uh to get typing them in. Um, so uh, I guess, it, it, Lawrence, is there anything else that you would want to add about what you've what you've covered here or, or maybe what you've kind of learned from, from doing this proof of concept? Um, I would love if, if anybody in the audience is interested in it, like, like Will or something, then please reach out to me. Uh, I'm lmb at isurveillant.com. I'm also on the, like I have a Mastodon thing, lmb on Fostodon, if you, if you prefer that. Um, and the really uh, and eBPF Slack, of course, as well. Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, I'm also on there, uh, also LMB, and there's like an eBPF channel on the Cilium Slack that we could talk about, uh, which is also nice. And, or if you prefer, there's like a BPF mailing list that you can also find me on. Wonderful. Uh, Russell's asked a very pertinent question. Oh, no, press the right thing. So Russell's asking if there is a link to the proof of concept code. Yes, there is. Um, I will put it in the hack MD. I think that's probably the easiest. Um, that's great. And then you should be able to check it out. You'll have to compile your own kernel. Um, but after that, it's smooth sailing, I promise. Kwaku <laughs> uh, has asked if there's a way to view the conference where this signing is discussed. I'm not sure whether those talks go on YouTube or not, but I know the slides are. Um, they do go on YouTube. If you put the okay. same, um, by the way, hi, Quoco. I think you might have contributed to the eBPF library, if that is true. Thank you very much. If not, maybe you want to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think it is on YouTube. If you if you put the title of the talk into YouTube on the Linux Foundation um, channel, you'll be able to find it there. That's a really good point, actually. Like, if if anybody's interested in like actually hearing the the feedback unfiltered, not to my, not all, <laughs> I only heard the good stuff. I didn't hear the bad stuff. Then go on YouTube and have a look at it. I'll put that in the show notes as well. You were right. He has contributed. Excellent. Fantastic. That's really Thanks great. so much. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, wonderful. And uh, okay, it looks like Will has. I, I, I'm not sure quite where the, where the link has gone, but I'm sure we'll find it. But uh, Will has found the YouTube recording. So, in fact, Will, if you cool. wanted to add it into the HackMD, that it should be editable. So, if you can add it directly into the show notes, that would be marvelous. Um, yeah, wonderful. And uh, yeah, I thoroughly recommend also to the audience to check out um, that link about all the other talks because I think there's a ton of really interesting topics absolutely um and uh yeah hopefully we'll be able to talk about some more of those ideas in future episodes of uh, echo so brilliant uh i'm gonna just say thank you so much to the audience for your wonderful questions and uh participating and massive thanks to you lawrence for joining us today and sharing the difficulties around ppf signing and your approach to solving those problems so thank you very, thank you very much. much yeah thank you all right. Take care, everyone. Bye Take for care. now. Bye-bye.